Okay, all of these things are used in a way that is just brutal, right? World War I is called a war of attrition. It means that we are going to spend months fighting over the same half-mile patch of ground, a no-man's land, that is going to be a swirly mess of barbed wire, potholes, corpses, and unexploded shells. It is brutal. Okay, trench warfare is no pretty thing to behold. How did it affect the mindset of the soldiers? The soldiers very quickly became disenchanted uh, with the war effort. You can read that in their accounts. Uh, many of them began to see the war as being a war that their government was exacting upon the population, that the population, the soldiers themselves, were not necessarily the ones at war with each other. How does the U.S. get involved in this? Well, the United States sits out the first three years of the war, and they do so by being a neutral nation and shipping goods to both sides, primarily to the France and Brit uh, French and British shores, I should say. Not as much to Germany and Austria-Hungary, but they do trade with both sides. When America finally gets in, it's because of a threat to American shipping and also a proposed alliance. Uh, the Germans send a note called the Zimmerman Note, or Zimmerman Telegram, down to Mexico saying, hey, why don't you invade the United States? And that way we'll pinch them in a two-front war. They'll have to fight you in Mexico and us in Europe. And the note also sets forth the fact that the Germans will return to what's called unrestricted submarine warfare. In other words, they will sink any ship getting near the English or French coast, even if it happens to be a neutral ship like the United States. This has been trouble before. Remember, the sinking of the Lusitania fell under this sort of a category. Now, if you're German, you know, this is what you have to do. This seems savage, but you cannot allow American ships to continue to flood resources into those two countries. Germany is having a horrible time fighting the war. And those countries, Britain and France, are really hanging on because they have America as kind of their Costco providing all of these goods. That can't go on. When that Zimmerman note comes out, it's clear that Germany is working against us. We declare war, and we're in the war, we, I should say, the United States, for about a year. Let's talk about the home front, though. The total war aspect of this is really cool. Not that I want to see civilizations have to gear up for war, but I think the way in which they made the civilization almost indistinguishable from the battlefield in the sense that every individual was a combatant, even though they might not have put on a uniform or carried a weapon, no matter who you were, you were a significant part of the war effort. If you were a four-year-old kid... Eat your food. Don't waste it. That's how you fight the war. If you're a 90-year-old grandma, we don't expect you to pick up a rifle. We do expect you to buy war bonds. That's how we ask you to contribute. So total war is the making of the war all the way across the civilization, using all of the resources that the civilization can muster. Going down my list of things here, we have to conscript an army. No matter how much enthusiasm there is in the early months and the volunteerism of people, once the stories of the war start getting home, we're probably not going to be as good at recruiting an army on a volunteer basis. So we're going to need to conscript or draft a much larger army. We're going to plan the economy. We're going to set wages. We're going to set prices. We're going to establish rationing. We are going to make sure that people conserve their resources, right? Everything's towards the war effort. So we're going to tell our civilians what to eat and not to waste the resources that we should use for the soldiers. That total war mentality then makes everyone at home in a civilian sense also a combatant. We're going to convince people to do this with propaganda. We saw some marvelous posters, right? And the effort here is to make sure that people understand what they're fighting for. We can't afford for the mindset of the nation to fall apart. We have to make sure that people understand this is what we're fighting for. And what we're fighting for is a just cause. And the enemy isn't just someone that we're kind of meh on. The enemy is someone we hate. We hate them. And we have to be willing to sacrifice just as much as those guys getting shot at at the front. How did it affect women? Women are going to come out during World War I in a variety of ways, mostly industrial. We need workers. We need people in munitions factories to provide the shells and the equipment for the war. Normally that would be men, but we know where they are. They're at the front. So we need the women to work in those industries, which we, they do. We also need women to volunteer in civilian roles in the military. We need ambulance drivers. Uh, we need nurses. We need people to do logistical work, and women are going to provide all of those. Now, after the war... As the men come back from the war, the, the assumed idea is that, hey, women, thank you very much. It's been good. See ya. Go back home. There's going to be some struggle over that. But a lot of civilizations are going to grant women the right to vote after World War I. That's a big change. 
Discuss events associated with the Armenian Genocide. One of the ugliest parts of Total War is when you turn your civilization against kind of the common enemy or the other, if you will. And in this case, it's the Turkish population turning against the Armenian minority that lives within their borders. The Armenians are Christians and the Turkish are Muslims. And during the war, the Turkish assumed that the Armenians would be more likely to support the Russians, who also shared that common Eastern Christianity background, and thought that they would be a threat, and therefore they killed them. Somewhere on the order of a million to a million and a half Armenian civilians are killed uh, during the course of World War I. Let's move down. The ending of the war. Let's put the wraps on this thing. The ending of the war is an armistice, and that's a very important phrase. It's not a surrender. The Germans never officially waved the white flag. Both sides agreed to stop. And that meant that the Germans thought they were going to get a favorable peace. They thought they were going to get, flipping over here, a Woodrow Wilson-type peace, a peace with justice. They were going to be given the opportunity to simply lay down their arms, and we would all kind of call it even and go back to normal. Not the case, right? David Lloyd George and George Clemenceau, representing uh, Britain and France, respectively, want flesh and blood. These are guys who have been in the war now for four years. They want the Germans to pay for the war in a literal sense. We want them to admit the guilt for the war. We want to punish them. And therefore, both of those leaders are going to go to Versailles, where we're going to negotiate the peace treaty and hammer home a much more vengeful peace than the one Woodrow Wilson intends to form. So when these two forces come together, the Woodrow Wilson, we should never fight again, peaceful, um, just ending to the war, and the Clemenceau Lloyd George let's tater the Germans for the war they caused, that is what we are looking for in, in a clash, right? I just got a text message. It flashed across the top. So I was reading it while I was saying that, and I sounded like a fool. I'm not going to start over 14 minutes in here, so I apologize. But let me say that whole thing again. Wilson thinks that we should have a very polite, almost um, peaceful ending to this war, that it should be just. We should all acknowledge that we made a mistake. The French and the British are like, no, we are not going to have it that way. The Germans are going to pay. What are the Germans forced to agree to at Versailles? They are forced to accept the guilt of the war. Ouch. They are forced to pay reparations or money to the French and the British. Ouch. They lose territory, Alsace and Lorraine. They lose their colonies, ostensibly to the League of Nations, but in reality uh, to the French and the British. They are also forced to accept a 100,000-man army. That is to say, an army that you wouldn't use to attack anyone because you know it's too small. All of those things on top of a League of Nations, though, right? Wilson gets his League of Nations. Wilson thinks that if there's a League of Nations, we will never, ever, ever, ever have a long conflict again because nations will use things like economic sanctions or they'll use diplomatic reasons in order to stop the war. They will make sure there's not a long war. That's a bit idealistic, Mr. Wilson, and just for the record, we'll be back in 20 years here because there's going to